Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Jeff Talk on the 8 Women Podcast. In this one, I hope to be an addition that is relatively rare. And that's because this one is in honor of the memory and scientific legacy of Dr. Richard Veach. He was 84 and he passed away on January 30th, 2020. I never knew him. I don't know any of his family members personally, but his work on metabolic biochemistry, the thermodynamics of metabolism, and ketones, and specifically ketone esters, have really made a massive impact of the overall scientific understanding of metabolism and has played a foundational part of my work at HVMN today. My condolences to his family, his friends. I'm very sorry for your loss. His loss is one that might not affect me at a personal level, but definitely impacts the scientific community and the ketone and ketosis space broadly, and of course impacts our work at HVMN. My interface with Dr. Richard Veach really intersects along the lines of ketone esters. HVMN ketone ester is our flagship product and it contains the Delta G ketone ester that Dr. Richard Veach and his co-inventor and longtime collaborator, Professor Kieran Clark from Oxford, invented back in the early 2000s. I know and work very closely with Professor Kieran Clark since 2016. So obviously working really closely with Professor Clark, a lot of our work has been focused on the technology, the scale up, the production, and the education around ketone esters. But through all those conversations, we also dove into the science, the metabolism, the thermodynamics of what is actually going on when you have ketones being metabolized in the body, in the mitochondria. I learned so much, essentially a masterclass in a tutoring of ketone physiology and all the science and literature that Clark and Veach have done over the last 27 years. Uh, I know that they initiated their initial collaboration back in 1993. There's been literally decades of experience that they've put together and published that really helped define our modern understanding of metabolism. Some of the most memorable conversations I've had with Kieran over the years were about the people behind the science, the personalities behind the research papers. Through those conversations, I really got a sense of Dr. Richard Veach as a man, as a personality, as an intellect, as an academic, his strengths, his genius, but also some of his idiosyncrasies. I think that's really the beauty of humanity, the beauty of life, or all these multifaceted, multidimensional creatures. One of my regrets towards the end of 2018 was when Kieran and I were actually coordinating with the NIH press office to have Dr. Veach on the HVMN program. I think, Zill, I don't know if you remember that, but we were trying to coordinate. It's definitely you know, something that I regret at this point of not have made a stronger push to actually make that happen. We could have made that happen. Some of my other insights into Dr. Veach comes from a couple other close collaborators and friends of mine, including former HVMN research lead, Dr. Brianna Stubbs, who I know visited Dr. Veach back in 2018. She had interesting anecdotes and gave me inside tips of some of the unpublished research that he has been working on. I also recently met with Bill Curtis over at the Metabolic Health Summit over in Long Beach uh, just a few weeks ago. And he also relayed a number of interesting anecdotes and observations and some of the research directions that they were pursuing before Veach passed. Hopefully I do all of my friends and my collaborators and partners some justice. First, I'll start with Dr. Richard Veach's biographical facts. And then I'll go into what I think is some of his most interesting contributions to science. Talk about how his work has impacted my thinking about ketone physiology and metabolism. And then maybe give some indications of where the future the space will go, the legacy, the scientific legacy of his work. Richard Veach was born in 1935 in Decatur, Illinois, and he eventually went to Harvard University for two degrees. He did his undergraduate degree in history and literature, and then went to the medical school to become a medical doctor. Along the path of being a practicing clinician, he decided to understand metabolism in a more serious research setting. So he decided to go get a PhD at Oxford University, studying what he thought was the best metabolism research group in the world. And that group was led by a gentleman named Hans Krebs. If that name sounds familiar, 
you're probably right because you probably heard of that name in your high school biology class. If you remember, there's the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, and that's the metabolic pathway that generates ATP in your mitochondria. It seems that that deep training with Krebs really focused Veach's interest into metabolic pathways and redox cycles in the mitochondria. And that was really the seminal substrate that led to his work with ketones in subsequent decades. One of the bizarre parts of history that I only just recently learned about was that on his way back to US from England, he actually ended up in an airplane crash in October 1968. Of 42 people on that passenger plane, only 10 survived, and Richard Veach was one of them. He was actually named a hero of New Hampshire for helping provide medical care and rescuing his fellow passengers, even while he had a broken back from the crash itself. Veach ultimately ended up at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, under the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, where he eventually ran his own lab as a lab chief. This is the lab that he ran until he passed just a few weeks ago. My understanding of Dr. Veach from some of his colleagues was that he was in the lab every single morning conducting research and thinking about ketones and metabolism until the day he died. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about where I think some of his most interesting scientific contributions were and how they impact society at large and how they impact our current modern understanding of metabolic biochemistry. And I trace this back to one of his key papers that was published in 1995 in the FASEB journal. The paper is titled Insulin, Ketone Bodies, in mitochondrial energy transduction and is published with first author Sato as well as some co-authors including Professor Clark at Oxford. And this I believe was one of the initial collaborations that Professor Clark and Veach kicked off over their almost 30 year research collaboration and partnership. I've read this paper a number of times to be honest over the years. It's a very dense and very technical paper. If you look at this paper, the Sato paper, compared to most biochemistry or physiology papers, this is much more mathematical. It's almost physics-like or chemistry-like, given the quantitative nature of how they characterize the energetics of ketone metabolism versus other types of substrate metabolism. Now, the key result here really introduced ketone bodies as a highly efficient energy source. The key result was that ketone bodies, when introduced into profuse rat heart, made the hearts perform much more efficiently and produce much more power given the same amount of oxygen. So really increasing the output to oxygen ratio. Now, the more technical part of this paper is talking about the Gibbs free energy and the redox span that changes when the mitochondria is metabolizing ketones versus other types of substrate. Now, again, this is taking something in the realm of biology, which is oftentimes very qualitative, and something that's very quantitative and very mathematical. So I think this is very interesting in terms of a uh, paper in physiology. So what is redox span? What is Gibbs free energy? Let's define Gibbs free energy first. In the late 1870s, an American scientist, Josiah Gibbs, described this phenomenon as an available energy. He defines this as the greatest amount of mechanical work which can be obtained from a given quantity of a certain substance in a given initial state. So really it's like the maximum potential of the energy within a set of molecules or set of compounds. So you have more Gibbs free energy, there's more energetic potential in that system. So in that sense, you want more of this Gibbs free energy. It means more available energy. Now, the interesting result from the Sato paper was that they found that the Gibbs free energy of ATP was greater when the mitochondria were metabolizing beta hydroxybutyrate. Well, why is that? Well, the redox couples within the Krebs cycle actually change their concentration. So what happens is that in complex one, one of the first parts of the electron transport chain, there is a reduction in the NAD couple. So you get more NADHs versus NAD pluses. So this creates a more negative 
energy potential. And what happens at complex two is that coenzyme Q gets oxidized. So there's more of a positive potential. So what that difference is, you got is that you get an increased redox span. There's a greater potential that is created within the electron transport chain. And that translates into a greater Gibbs free energy of ATP when the mitochondria is metabolizing BHB. BHB is short for beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the main ketone body. I think this line of thinking is actually very interesting because it speaks to me as someone with a math and physics background. I was actually thinking about being a physicist before ending up studying computer science at Stanford. So getting quantitative and, and treating biology as and, and think about in a closed system of thermodynamics is very attractive to me. It makes sense from a rigor and robustness perspective. Veach and his collaborators like Clark, Sato, Bill Curtis, some of his uh, longtime collaborators, I think are very, very sharp there. And I have much to learn from them about the specific nuances in here. So I'd recommend actually all my listeners who are very curious and interested in diving into this specific line of understanding metabolism to really review these old papers and really grok the mathematics of what's actually going on here. Makes a lot of sense why Veach and Clark and the rest of the research groups started looking at ketones as a really interesting metabolic substrate. Fast forward about eight, 10 years, that work resulted in a DARPA grant to look at making ketone esters as a food for high performance athletes and high performance soldiers. That resulting work with the DARPA grant was the Delta G ketone ester. And of course that Delta G goes back and harkens to the reference of the Gibbs free energy that is improved when one is metabolizing ketone bodies. And now fast forward another 17 years now to 2020, HVMN and I have been working very closely with Professor Clark and TLTS, the Oxford spin-out company that's been helping commercialize the Delta G ketone ester and have hopefully impacted and benefited thousands of customers who are now incorporating Veach's work, Clark's work as part of their everyday life. And that's an honor for me to be and play a small part in making that possible. One of his last publications before his passing was a paper titled The Great Controlling Nucleotide Coenzymes. And this is a great survey to cover what I think was his hope of the potential of ketone esters as not just a product and technology to improve human performance, but also have applications and implications for a number of therapeutic and medical indications. And if you read the paper, it really looks at the entire scope of how ketones and ketone esters could be a fundamental game changer for how we think about nutrition, health, and medicines. We've all heard of NAD and NAD precursors as a popular vitamin or supplement to incorporate for longevity. And I think Veach's understanding here really makes the story much more nuanced and complicated. It's not just having NAD precursors available. It's also very important what the ratios of NADH and NAD plus are. It's important when you have a ketone metabolism, how the redox potentials change. Where being in a ketogenic state or being in ketosis, drives these ratios in the right direction. It's not alone enough just to have the precursors for NAD, but you need to actually have the actual metabolism drive the ratios and drive the redox in the right direction. One analogy that I really like is a notion of a battery. The voltage in a AAA battery, which is really small, and a D battery can be the same but there's a lot more power stored in the D versus the AAA. And you can kind of take that same analogy to NAD precursors and BHB metabolism. You need to have not just the voltage, but you also need to have the power behind it to really make the system work. The NAD story, I think gets a little bit more complicated when you need to see that NAD in itself is very small coenzyme in the overall Krebs cycle, BHB, and ketosis impacts the entire Krebs cycle where yes, NAD is an important part, 
but I don't think it's sufficient or necessarily the most important part when you look at the overall system here. To conclude my thoughts here, and I think Veach would agree, you don't need just NAD precursors through supplements. You also want to be in ketosis, either through a ketogenic diet or fasting, or through a ketone ester that you can consume exogenously as well. I think Dr. Veach had so much hope for the applications of ketone esters and ketosis for a number of indications, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, metabolic syndrome, diabetes. And the research is just coming around the corner, it's just starting now or just under progress. Given what I understand the data I've seen, I think he has a lot of reason to be excited and to be proud of his work and his predictions and his hypotheses. I think he would be very proud and very thankful for all the folks who are following on his footsteps and really standing on his shoulders to help further humanity's knowledge about physiology, metabolic biochemistry, and ketone metabolism. That concludes my thoughts for this edition of Jeff Talk. Again, thank you so much for taking the time with me to honor Richard Veach's memory and scientific legacy. Until next time, stay well, be well. Talk to you guys soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.